Artificial intelligence has become one of the most important tools in the modern world. It knows what tweets you want to read, it can understand your handwriting, and it can drive your car. AI are important because while humans are pretty smart and good at performing a number of tasks, computers are better. Much better. Or at least they can be if they're programmed by an above average intelligence human. The key to useful and powerful AI is the ability to learn and make its own decisions. And the burning question on my mind is, how do AI work? Computers, fundamentally, need to be told what to do, and a computer just doing what it's told to do is not exactly intelligent. So how can we get it to make its own informed decisions? This is the issue of machine learning. At the heart of this issue is a computer's ability to do two things. The first has already been mentioned, make its own decisions. Secondly, it needs to be able to make predictions, and a good AI will do so with minimal error. But how do we actually achieve machine learning? Well, AI are implemented in so many different ways, it's hard to answer this question very generally. But like most computer science problems, the solution starts with an algorithm. There are a lot of different machine learning algorithms and protocols that are applied in different circumstances, but to get the best idea of how this all works, I'm just going to focus on a popular and widely used method. A lot of AI systems are built up from what's called biologically inspired computing. After all, living organisms are some of the best thinking, decision-making machines around. If you want to build something that thinks, the first and most obvious point of call is to simulate some kind of brain, some kind of information processing machine that can make different decisions given different information. This is the basis of a neural network. Neural networks are a kind of rough simulation of a collection of neurons. In a neural network, the system takes in some starting information, which stimulates a bunch of neurons. Depending on which neurons are stimulated, other neurons get stimulated, and the whole process repeats until a final result is computed. So how do we actually implement something like this in practice? Well, simple neural networks are built up from systems called perceptrons. These are a kind of artificial neuron. Each perceptron takes in several binary inputs, x1, x2, x3, and so on. It uses these to produce an output, y, just by taking their sum. The output itself also has to be binary. So how do we deal with this? Well, we say that if the sum of the inputs is greater than or equal to some threshold, then y is equal to 1. If the sum of the inputs is less than the threshold, then y equals 0. The idea of a threshold is a good starting point, but in practice, we instead tend to say that the output is equal to 1 if the sum, plus some negative number b, called the bias, is greater than or equal to 0. The bias is a representation of how easy it is for the perceptron to output a 1. But it's no different from the threshold idea, it just keeps everything centred around 0. This is a good start, but it's quite a basic model and doesn't allow for much complexity in terms of making different decisions. The problem is that each input, xi, has the same weighting. We can build up a better system if we assign a unique weighting w to each input. We can then multiply each input by its weighting when we take their sum. This allows for different inputs to contribute different amounts and gives the perceptron a sense of importance for each input. Say we're building a perceptron that will compute for us whether or not we should go outside today. The decision might be decided by the following factors. Does the weather look nice right now? Does the forecast say it'll be nice all day? And do I have a jacket? These three factors might be of different importance to you. It might matter a lot that the weather is nice right now, so you give it a weighting of 2. It might matter a bit if the forecast says that it's going to be nice all day, so you give it a weighting of 1.5. And it may not really matter all that much to you if you have a jacket, so you just give it a weighting of 1. Now all you have to do is set your bias. Let's say you set it at minus 2.5. Remember the bias has to be negative. And now you go and gather all of the relevant information. Say the weather does look good outside, but the forecast doesn't say it'll be nice all day, and you do have a jacket. The inputs are now known, so we can compute the sum, which comes out at 0.5. The output y is then equal to 1, as the sum plus the bias is greater than or equal to 0. So now that we can tweak each perceptron to act very differently, we can pile on layer after layer of artificial neuron. More layers means more decisions, more decisions means more outputs. This network of perceptrons is what we call a neural network. It starts at the output layer, where the initial data is processed, and then a series of hidden layers compute further information, until the final decisions are made at the output layer. So is that it? Does the whole discussion of neural networks end with perceptrons? Well, of course not. Perceptrons have a few big problems. Firstly, the output from a perceptron can immediately jump between 0 and 1. Making a small change to the weights or bias can lead to an entirely different result. Secondly, the weights must be predetermined. We might not always choose the most suitable values. So we'd like a way for the system to be able to adjust the weights itself in order to minimise error when making predictions. To deal with the first problem, we need to change the actual structure of the artificial neuron itself. Instead of using a perceptron network, we instead use what's called a sigmoid neuron. Sigmoid neurons give an output determined by the sigmoid function. The argument of the sigmoid function, z, is just the sum minus the bias. If z is very large, the sigmoid function is practically 1. But if it's very small, then the sigmoid function gives out practically 0. Now we have a function where making a small change to z will only make a small, gradual change in the output. 
As well as fixing our original problem, the sigmoid neuron has a continuous spectrum of outputs, unlike the step function before. So now we can build up a network of artificial neurons that can make a bunch of different decisions based on what starting information it gets. But how can it actually teach itself to adjust certain parameters, like the weights? Well, it just so happens, there's an algorithm for that. The backpropagation algorithm is a method used to train neural networks. To utilise backpropagation, the neural network has to be given some training examples. This is just a set of inputs for which we know the desired output. A bit like data you would use to fit a curve in statistics, it uses the given outputs to compute its own outputs. Predictions. We then need a way to compare these predictions to the desired outputs, the kind of measurement of how good our neural network is. For this, we define the cost function. The cost function takes the sum of the difference squared between the desired output and the prediction. If all the predictions are close to the desired outputs, then the cost function is roughly zero. But if the predictions are off by a lot, then the cost function will give back a very large value. The obvious goal here is to get the network to minimise the total cost. This is done by adjusting the weights so that they're optimal for minimising the cost function. But to adjust the weights, we need to calculate something called the gradient of the cost function. And this is where backpropagation comes in. I'm not going to go into the detail on the mass behind backpropagation. That requires its own video and one that I'll inevitably be making in the future. But backpropagation works by using two phases, propagation and weight update. To start the propagation phase, we give an initial guess as to what the weight should be and then enter the training inputs into the system. The inputs are propagated through the network as usual until the network produces outputs. After the network makes its predictions, an error is calculated for each desired output. The reason for doing this is that the errors for a neuron in any particular layer, say L, can be expressed in terms of the errors of the neurons in the next layer up, L plus one. So starting from the output layer, the errors are propagated backwards until an error has been calculated for each neuron in the network. Once all of the errors have been calculated, they can be used to calculate the gradient of the cost function. As I mentioned previously, this is used to slightly optimise the weights, usually in an algorithm called gradient descent. The weights are only updated a small amount each time, the rate at which is called the learning rate, unsurprisingly. Having a small learning rate means that the training examples could have to be run many hundreds of times before the weights are optimal, which might not be very practical. And a learning rate that's too large may cause you to overshoot the optimal values. But in practice, we now have a way to train a neural network, however complex, to give the best possible outcomes it can. The only downside is that it needs to see some examples first. Training examples are a very common technique in machine learning. Take for example Microsoft's Tay tweets, a Twitter AI that learns what to say by reading other people's tweets from across the internet. The idea was well intentioned and started out innocently, but like a lot of things on the internet, it went quite wrong. Tay was eventually deactivated after people started having some not so family friendly conversations with her on Twitter and Tay picked up some bad habits. But neural networks are an incredibly useful starting point for thinking about AI and the wider field of biologically inspired computing in general. This leads the way for concepts like genetic algorithms, which a computer can use to teach itself how to solve a variety of problems. At this point, I couldn't say that I completely explained how AI works. That would be pretty much impossible, let alone in one video. But hopefully I provided some decent insight into how to get a string of ones and zeros to think just like you, maybe even better. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, be sure to subscribe to the channel. And if you're interested in computer science, check out some of my other related videos.